get us started, uh, I next want to go ahead and pass it over to Mr. Uh, Matt Bunkers up at our Rapid City office, and he's got a presentation for us here today uh, titled Observations of Hail Wind Ratios from Convective Storm Report Reports Across the Continental United States. So you should see Matt's screen here shortly, and uh, we'll open up uh, Matt's mic, should be open right now, and you should be good to go, Matt. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. So how long have we been including these hail and wind tags and warnings? It's been what, about nine or 10 years that we started around 2010. And what do you have set as your defaults and warns you uh, for hail and wind? So that's the question actually that Tommy in Grand Forks asked about a year ago and that got us going on this research. So, you know, why are we doing this? In addition to, to what I just mentioned, uh, there is not much guidance on the wind tags for our severe convective warnings. Uh, Scott Boyer's done some good work with hail, but we just were missing that for wind. So we're looking at this from a climatological perspective. Uh, in addition, it would help, uh, having this kind of information would help uh, inform the defaults for your warn gen tags. You know, some might not have any default set. That's the way we are at Rapid City. Some actually have default set. And that may vary uh, based on where you are within central region, in fact, across the uh, continental United States. And we know that there are many biases with the storm report database. Uh, for example, population affects the hail and wind reports. Uh, but we believe that the ratio of hail to wind may be less affected by these artifacts. And we'll see that in uh, some of the time series. So I wanna thank Daryl Hertzman from Iowa State for providing this graph. Um, if you like all the information that he does provide, please reach out to him and thank him because he gets very little uh, support for doing what he does, things like the IEM Cal and all the other tools that he has provided. Anyway, so he provided this graph and it's very clear that the defaults of 60 mile per hour winds and one inch hail are evident in the warnings. Collectively, that amounts to a little over 38% of our warnings. And then we also see that almost 50% of the time, one inch hail is used in warnings and nearly 78% of the time, a 60 mile per hour tag is used in the warnings. You can also see that uh, sub severe winds, uh, 50 miles an hour, 11%, and then 70 mile per hour around 10%. So clearly these defaults of 60 to, and one inch collectively are, are evident. So what are we not doing with this work? It's important to say, uh, this isn't a study about the verification of hail and wind tags in the warnings. We're not doing that at all. So we want to make that clear. We're also not comparing the ratio of hail to wind tags. We're comparing the ratio of hail to wind reports only. And then finally, we did not specifically address convective mode, so we didn't look at the ratios and say how, how were they broken down in terms of convective mode. However, we do look at convective mode in a broader sense to explain some of our results. So I wanna make it clear on what we mean by hail and wind ratios, uh, and it's fairly straightforward, but uh, for a ratio of one, you have the same number of hail uh, reports as you do wind reports. It says nothing about the absolute number of reports. A ratio of two, obviously twice as much hail as wind. A half would be twice as much wind as hail, and then 0.33, three times the number of wind as hail. So bottom line is less than one, uh, you have more wind than you do hail. We required at least 30 reports to calculate a ratio, and we needed at least one report of wind, otherwise the ratio would be undefined. So what are some of the biases and problems that, that affect the study, I'm sure, uh, you, a lot of them come to mind when, when you uh, think of all the, the things that can affect storm reporting. And one happens to be our, our culture and our practices. Some offices are more aggressive at getting reports, and some may just get an initial report for a warning and, and call that good. Um, so this, this chart on the right is from Steve Weiss and others, uh, Severical Storms paper um, for reports prior to 1999. So, uh, things are a little bit different since then, but it does show uh, certainly places that have a lot of reports next to very few reports, and clearly that is uh, indicative of, of operational practice and practices, not necessarily uh, meteorological uh, happenings that are going on. 
Um, there's been an increase with reports in time, as we've, we've noted, and uh, hail is easier to warn for than wind. That's going to affect the, the uh, warning operations. Hail is also easier to estimate than wind. That can affect verification. Um, there's actually a couple of referee papers that note that there are very few follow-on reports in some cases after that initial verification. So if you get an initial report, let's say, of wind, you might not follow up to get the hail because you're moving, you know, you're, you're working in a severe weather event, it's busy, you may not get follow-on reports unless the reports of opportunity or chance that come your way. And here are several other things that can affect the database. And um, I have et cetera here because I'm sure you could add one or two of your own to this list. There's, there's a lot of things. And, and the long story short is the day, and we all know this, the storm report database is really messy. But you know it, it is the best in the world, and that's that's what we got to use. So there have been some changes that have occurred over time. I'm sure you know a few of these. You might not know this first one. In 1970, the uh, severe wind criterion was lowered from 65 knots to 50 knots. Uh, then in the 1990s, uh, over a period of about a decade, maybe even starting in the late eight, uh, 1980s, we modernized. We at new offices, a lot of new people coming on and working, and the radar upgrade had not really affected the way the reports uh, came in. In 2006, uh, not necessarily a big effect on, on gathering reports, but we also started documenting measured gusts at that time. In 2007, we made our change to polygon-based warnings, and then another notable change in 2010, we increased the severe hail criterion to one inch. So. Uh, playing Jeopardy now, the category is convective storm reports for $800. The answer is 90%. Uh, I'll give you a few seconds to think about that, and if anybody wants to type it into the box, then uh, Bruce or Greg can tell me uh, the question. So that's, that's plenty of time if you're playing Jeopardy. So the answer is what percentage of severe convective wind gust reports are estimated? That's 90 percent. Uh, you may have already seen this from Roger Edwards' paper. Uh, on the left are the estimated gusts from 2006 to 2015. Whopping 90 percent of all the gusts are estimated. And then we see the, on the right the measured gusts, which seem to have a little bit more uniform distribution across the CONUS. Roger Edwards and his companions also recommended that uh, to do an apples to apples comparison that the estimated gusts are multiplied by 80% to bias correct. That would mean a 73 mile per hour estimated gust would really equate to a 58 mile per hour bias corrected gust. And uh, they, I think, were leaning towards people doing this for things like uh, risk analysis, insurance assessments, and so forth. But of course, we're looking at this operationally, and so we have uh, stuck with all the estimated gusts because that's what you know, we end up using. Uh, but it's definitely something that makes things more complicated. So here's a map of the ratio of severe hail to severe wind from 2006 to 2017 uh, by state. And we see that, by and large, in the central United States, the ratios are greater than one. Uh, in, indicating more hail relative to wind, and especially in the states along to the east of the Rocky Mountains. Whereas in the east, the ratios are around a half or even less, indicating uh, more wind by uh, you know twice or three times as much wind relative to hail, looking at all of the reports uh, from 2006 to 2017. And then if we look at the uh, same ratios, but now we're looking at hail to measured gust only. We see a huge jump. I can back up here. You can see ratios around 0.5. They jump to 10 to even up to 35. So a huge difference over the, uh, especially the eastern United States, when you only look at measured gusts, suggesting that hail would be, you know, 10 to 30 times more common than wind, severe hail compared to severe wind. And so we did also take into account here in this third chart the uh, ratio of hail to wind, where the wind is the measured gust plus the estimated gust at 63 miles per hour or greater, which would be that bias correction from the Edwards study. And that still shows fairly high ratios, greater than 
um, one, in fact, greater than 10 in, in several places across the East, much different than what uh, we would expect from just from using all the wind reports. And, and interestingly, in the West here, the changes are, are fairly small. In fact, uh, Nevada and Utah changed very little during that period. So at any rate, the ratios are 10 to, ti uh, 10 to 100 times larger when we only use the me measured gusts, and that's especially true in the eastern United States. Even if we account for that bias correction, the ratios are 1 to 10 times larger uh, for you when using that compared to using all the winds. And again, we decided to use all gusts for the study because this is an operational study, and it's you know what we're dealing with when we're out working at our weather forecast offices. So um, just, it's something important to keep in mind, um, but it does affect um, the results definitely. So here we're looking at the ratios and the reports. So on the uh, left y-axis, we have the ratios, and the ratios uh, at the time series is in orange. And then on the right, we have the number in hail, of hail and wind reports uh, with the, the wind being blue and the hail being green. And I have the periods of change marked with the vertical dashed lines. So, so the first thing we'll note, and this is very well documented, that the hail and the wind reports have increased with time, and especially through the modernization period. And then there's been somewhat of a leveling off, and we actually have seen the hail reports drop in the recent uh, decade or so, and that's clearly related to the hail, uh, severe hail criterion change. So then when we look at averages for the ratios during this, this period, and first off, I should note, notice that the ratios by and large stay fairly constant throughout the period with fluctuations. But when we look at the first period, we see the, ratio, the average ratio across the CONUS, a uh, little bit of right, right around 0.75, and then it drops during the second period when the wind um, threshold was relaxed from 65 to 50 knots. And then when we go to the modernization period, roughly this, this period uh, from 96 onward, we see a, a big increase in the ratios. And that's because during that time, the number of hail reports re received actually exceeded that, uh, or those of the wind. And then um, during this next period, there wasn't a whole lot of change. We had the change to polygon-based warnings that didn't have a, a big effect. And that's also been documented with tornadoes by a recent study by Harold Brooks and uh, one of his co-authors. And then finally, in this, this last period, we see a, a notable drop in the ratios again, actually matching the pre-modernization era. Uh, and that is uh, clearly related to the change in our warning criteria. The average during this entire period right here from modernization onward um, is kind of is in between these two. And we ended up uh, deciding to go uh, with that period, 1996, as a starting point uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, when we started 1996, we still maintain over 70% of all the reports versus if we start at 2010, uh, we're, we're right at a quarter to a third of all reports. And also, when we look at our, our maps, which I'm not going to show here today for all the time periods, but when we look at them for these different periods, 96 onward, 2010 onward, or even 1955 onward, they all have a similar spatial pattern. So it was a balance of, of the, uh, the having enough reports uh, for the, uh, the most recent period. So here's a look at the... Uh, severe hail to severe wind ratios from 1996 uh, onward um, for, the, for the whole year as stratified by zone. So there's a few things that, that should jump out at you right here. Uh, number one is the topography uh, in the High Plains region seems to, to uh, uh, factor into this. So we see the highest ratios in, in areas along to the east of the Rockies as well as throughout the High Plains. Well, we see the lowest uh, ratios over the uh, eastern United States over uh, relatively lower terrain. Um, and note that the Appala Appalachian Mountains actually kind of stand out in here. Uh, the Black Hills where I'm at stand out, even some higher areas out in uh, Oregon, uh, Arizona, a place southeast of the Snake River Valley, they, they stand out as having higher ratios where you have this uh, more uh, mountainous type of terrain. Um, population also is a factor. It's greater, more populated in the eastern United States. And you can even see some signs of mesonets because of this. You look at the Oklahoma panhandle, and uh, Oklahoma's had a mesonet for a long time, and you see lower ratios here. So it seems to be where there are mesonets, you may have 
relatively uh, better chance of getting wind reports. And my own CWA stands out um, with lower ratios indicating um, relatively more wind than places around us. And I know we've been fairly aggressive here at getting reports from the DOT, from South Dakota State University, and from the RAS. So that may, the, those practices within our own offices may clearly kind of stand out uh, among other areas. Um, another thing uh, I mentioned already, the lower elevation areas tend to have lower ratios. If you look at or can think about convective mode and some of the studies that uh, that Brian Smith and others at SBC have done, uh, right moving supercells or discrete convective mode is relatively most common here in the central United States. You would expect those to be more likely to produce hail than wind, not that they don't produce wind, and sometimes it's difficult to measure wind because there's smaller storms, but that is consistent with the convective mode. And then over the eastern United States, uh, you have a lot more QLCSs, uh, wind events, and you have this corridor in here where the ratios are relatively common. And uh, it was either a Canelio or a Bentley study that also showed a, another corridor down in here of the ratios. So that's consistent, uh, at least with the convective mode. Now, if we look at the land use, uh, you can see the scale at the lower left, uh, we see that uh, the forested and developed areas in the east really stand out. So that's what this uh, the, the you know, bright green is here. The deciduous forest, the developed land is, is in red. So that's an area where you, you have uh, more trees, deciduous trees and population where the wind reports are relatively more common. Um, in the central United States and in, in the mountains where you, so you'll have grassland, shrub crops, and then the darker green is a, more of an evergreen forest that's where these higher ratios uh, were, were prevalent. And um, so now if I toggle, uh, so I go back and forth here, you can see the land use versus the ratio. So again, I'll just point out here in the east, the lower ratios, you see the, see the land use pattern. And we look in the west, um, we see uh, the, the evergreen forest and the, the higher ratios. Also, if you look out in Oregon, again, forest, mountainous area with a higher ratio. So there seems to be a, a somewhat reasonable relationship between the land use and the uh, ratios of hail to wind. So we also broke up the ratios by time of day and um, for uh, the, these US climate regions that we see in the graph on the upper right. And so there's a few things that stand out, but most notably is that the largest ratios occur in the late morning through the mid afternoon. And that's when you have more hail, uh, relative to wind uh, for some places, and that's consistent with, with uh, a stable uh, boundary layer where you have, may have more elevated convection. And then the smallest ratios occur overnight, late um, in the evening, past midnight or past 6Z, when you have convective modes that have grown upscale, large MCSs, QLCSs, that sort of thing that are more conducive to wind. So that's consistent with what we would uh, what we observe meteorologically with the convective evolution. Other things to note is that the, uh, the southwest and northern Rockies Plains areas uh, have ratios that never go below one. So they always have relatively more hail than wind in those areas. And we also see that the, those, so those peaks are quite pronounced, whereas all the other regions have more muted uh, peaks in the late morning and mid-afternoon. Uh, places like the Ohio Valley, Northeast and Southeast remain less than three quarters throughout the entire period. We also took a subset of, of the uh, region. So I'll back up here. We also took the uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma area. And we looked at the uh, diurnal cycle of ratios for that as well. And the reason we did this, there's a couple studies, one by uh, Blue Stein and Reef and the other one by uh, uh, Stelt and Gallus uh, out of Iowa State, and they looked at, uh, they noted that there's a, a maximum of, in, of convective initiation overnight. There's actually a double max, roughly, I think, at 6Z and then again at, at uh, uh, 8 or 9Z. And so we thought, well, if there's a, a maximum in convective initiation overnight, it may be related to more of a discrete convective mode, which they did identify in some cases. And that should indicate that hail would become somewhat more common than wind. So like the earlier time series, we have the, uh, the ratios are in orange here with the uh, ratios on the left axis. 
and the hail and wind reports on the right. Again, this is for Kansas, Oklahoma, and Nebraska, April through August, so the, the warm season roughly. And so we do see that the ratios uh, are decreasing through about 7Z, and then they actually increase afterward, which would then point to there being more hail relative to wind. And keep in mind, this is this happening overnight when you're not necessarily getting a lot of reports uh, anyway. Um, but we, what we note is that the wind reports continue to decrease, whereas the hail doesn't decrease as much, and then it actually uh, holds steady throughout the morning. So this is consistent with that, that notion of that secondary convective initiation maximum after 60. And there's definitely a clear trend for lowering ratios through the evening as the convection is growing upscale. So we see these high ratios in the late morning through mid-afternoon, and then the ratios really nosedive all throughout the evening towards 60 as uh, the hail reports drop really fast relative to the wind. And that's very, again, very consistent with the timing of how convection is evolving to larger cold pool uh, QLCS type systems. Finally, we'll look at the uh, annual cycle to the ratios here. And that's also very evident, uh, just like the previous graph, graph, the ratios are on the left axis, the hail and wind reports on the right. So we see overall a minimum in the ratios in January and December in the, in the cold season, the coldest part of the year, but the ratios really ramp up in uh, February, March, and or I should say, yeah, February, March, and April, or March and April rather, and even into May. And that's when uh, the time of year when you're, you have the coldest uh, mid-level uh, temperatures with relatively warm surface temperatures. So you have the steepest lapse rates at that time of year, which is conducive to hail formation. And you also tend to have more discrete convection that time of year relative to later in a year when we see that the, the ratios really drop down in July. That's when we overall have relatively less steep lapse rates, very warm uh, mid-level temperatures, and systems tend to be more uh, uh, QLCS or linear, which would favor wind reports. So that's consistent with what we see with the, the evolution of convection throughout the year. And then there's a secondary peak in the fall which again uh, may be related to, it's, it's still, the ratio is still less than one, as you can see right here is one, but this, this uh, secondary maximum may be related to that secondary severe weather season we see in the fall, which again tends to have uh, an increase in the number of, of discrete convective mode. So um, I mentioned this, it's I believe some of this is related to the environment, the, the cool steep lapse rates in the spring and the warmer summer. Um, and then, of course, in the winter, that's a low cape, high shear environment. Now, one thing that I thought of um, also that could come into play here, again, non-meteorological factor would be tree foliage. So in the, or in the spring, you don't have as many leaves on the trees. You're still greening up. So you have less of a, of a um, footprint, if you will, for the wind to, to, to take down, whereas later in the summer, you tend to have more wind reports possibly because you're at full foliage and you have a greater target. So clearly there's, there's a commingling of the results or there's multiple factors that come into play here. But the, so there seems to be two, meteorological and non-meteorological, and it's very difficult to, to separate the two. But clearly there, there is uh, something related to the, or tied to the meteorology as well. So if we look now at the four months, two spring months on the top, March and April, we see very large ratios over a large part of the central and eastern United States. And even in the east where uh, for the, the year they average around 0.5, now we see that uh, they're, they're above one, such that there's more hail than wind reports there. And then we go to the July and August months and we see ratios that are less than one, even around a half in the southern into parts of the central U.S. Um, so there's clearly that seasonality to that. So what do I want you to, uh, to leave here with? Uh, first of all, there is a very clear pattern of the lowest ratios occurring overnight with the highest ratios during the late morning to mid-afternoon. So knowing nothing else, that should factor into how you may include hail or wind tags during various times of the day. Uh, secondly, uh, the higher ratios are, are fairly clear over the complex terrain and the high plains with lower ratios over the eastern conus. So that's, that's a fairly clear signal. Some of that may be related to meteorology, some of it to non-meteorology. And finally, the ratios are highest in the spring and relatively low in the summer. And again, all these are tied in part 
to the convective mode and the environment, but they're also related to things such as population, uh, mesonets, uh, land use, and land cover. So I'll finish with this question uh, based on what I presented. What, if anything, are you going to do to change in the way you set up your one gen defaults or you, you work your, your operations? Uh, it depends if you're going to be in Colorado versus uh, Kentucky, for example. Um, so just some things to ponder. And that's all I've got. Well, thank you, Matt. Fantastic presentation. Uh, you know, looking at, uh, at at hail and wind uh, in that manner and, and looking at the ratios uh, is kind of a unique way of looking at it. And I, I was left thinking that you, you did a great job quantifying, you know, a handful of patterns that maybe we would have expected both temporally and spatially, but there's a handful in there that, that were that were a little, little un, un, unexpected, which uh, I think makes your work even, even more eye-opening. So uh, great work. Any questions out there from the Sioux? We'll unmike uh, you so that you can pose your question. We have one question so far, and it's from uh, Jim Siva King. And uh, you are unmuted, Jim. Go ahead. Hey, Matt. Great presentation. I was wondering, um, how do the LSRs that only have wind damage, um, how are they used in this study? You know, it's a rough estimate to the severity of the of the wind. Or, but uh, did you estimate that, or did you just throw those out? I should have clarified that. We didn't address that specifically. What we did is use the severe GIS database from the Storm Prediction Center. So whatever was listed as uh, being a severe wind report, we went ahead and used that. Uh, so we weren't looking at, you know, was it 60 or 70 or 80 miles an hour? Just was it a, did it qualify as a severe convective wind report? All right, great, thank you. Any other questions out there for Matt? We are not seeing any others. Thanks again, Matt. Great presentation. I think this has some uh, very interesting uh, ISD service implications as well. So uh, if it hasn't already, I want to want to get this across the hall over to Mike Hudson and his group to to look at some of the uh, some of the service aspects on this. It certainly is largely science-based in our side of the house, but uh, has implications, I think, for both. So a uh, great presentation. I appreciate you contributing that to us uh, here today. Thank you, and if anybody wants the full data set, uh, I can tar that up and share it via a Google Drive. Great, great. Yeah, of course, your presentation will be part of our recording uh, of, of today's talk for folks that want to go back and listen to it.